Welcome back to Small Caps, ladies and gentlemen. My name, once again, Kerry Stevenson. And today I'm joined with Mark Yusko. He is the founder, CIO and CEO of Morgan Creek Capital Management over there in the United States of America. Mark, great to see you. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. No, Kerry, thanks for the invite and excited about our conversation today. Well, this is the first time you and I have had a conversation. So let's start off by asking you, um, who are Morgan Creek and how did you get started in this wild world of investing? Oh, happy accident. Uh, yeah, I would say my life's just a series of happy accidents and uh, kind of do them in reverse order. So, you know, I, I grew up thinking I wanted to be Mr. Brady, which is lost on, on most people nowadays. But back in when I was growing up, there was this show on TV called The Brady Bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the dad on the show was an architect. And I thought that was the greatest job ever. You got to build little models and design buildings. And so I went to school to be an architect. Turns out uh, architecture is very subjective. It's not very objective. People can like what you do or not would like what you do. And my first project, my professor said, just misses, B minus. I'm like, well, what do you mean just misses? That's not enough feedback. <laughs> so I, I dumped that, tried engineering, hated that. Uh, finished up actually pre-med of all things, biology and chemistry, loved it, but didn't have the calling to be a doctor. So I went to business school, took a job and the happy accident happened. My boss uh, retired and he was doing the investment portfo portfolio and they said, all right, go ahead and, and try your hand at that. So we managed bonds because we're a good old fashioned insurance company. And then I left there and went to work for an equity firm run by two professors back in the, the old days of kind of, they were the first quant firm to come out of a university back before personal computers. We were using the university computer to run computer screens, did that for a while. And, and then I got the call and, and really what changed the, the course of my career, I got the call from the alma mater. So I went to Notre Dame, see the fighting Irish behind me and oh, yeah. they called to say, hey, uh, we need someone to come help run the endowment. And I didn't really know what managing an endowment was. And, and, and I had this first of many aha moments in my career. And that what I realized, I thought investing was all about picking stocks and bonds. Yeah. Should I own Ford or GM? Should I own a treasury bond or a government bond? I mean, a, a corporate bond. And what I realized is, yeah, that's all this much important. What's really important is asset allocation. Am I in stocks mm -hmm. or bonds? Am I in commodities or currencies? Am I international, domestic, emerging markets? And so endowments follow this thing called the endowment model, as do big sovereign wealth funds and multi-generational families and any big sophisticated pool of capital. And they spoke focus very little time on Ford versus GM and lots of time on stocks versus bonds versus currencies versus commodities. So I did that for a number of years uh, and then came down here to North Carolina to take over the endowment at University of North Carolina. And then coming up on 19 years ago, left to form Morgan Creek. So the answer to the first question, what's Morgan Creek? So Morgan Creek was designed to bring the endowment model of investing to other investors, individuals, family offices, pension funds, endowments that didn't have staff. And what does that mean? Well, it's it's pretty simple. The endowment model is one, focused on asset allocation, mm -hmm. two, a high equity commitment. But equity doesn't mean stocks. There's real estate equity, commodity equity, private equity, venture capital equity, all kinds of different equity. Third is time horizon arbitrage. Because an endowment or a foundation or a multi-generational family lives forever, the average investor has a finite time horizon, you get paid an illiquidity premium for accepting that, that, that long time horizon. So you can do time horizon arbitrage. And then the final thing is value, right? Buy what's on sale, buy things mm -hmm. below their fair value, don't speculate, don't gamble. So those four core principles are, are what Morgan Creek tries to bring to clients. And over the years, we've done a bunch of different things from advisory business to funds to fund to funds. Today, I've kind of morphed toward direct investing and, and venture capital, but I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. 
Well, that was a, a that was a, a very uh, good overview, Mark. I, I know that recently you said, and I love this. I love this. The expect a lot of people don't look at the data. It's all about speculation. And what you said recently was the value of a lottery ticket is zero. It's more like a tax on the poor because people don't really yeah. understand investing. No, look, it it's so true. I mean, at the end of the day. Uh, data and and cash flow uh, is what drives the success or failure of any investment, right? In the world, you can either be one of two things. You can be an owner mm -hmm. or a loner. So okay. you either loan people money with the expectation of, of return, both a principal and interest, uh, although today now sometimes the banks don't don't do that they just loan based on you know greater fool theory but you can be a loaner uh or you can be an owner and you can own the equity of business and the way that the way I think about that and then the, the challenge I have with something like a lottery ticket is there are four ways to make money okay. only four right and yep. you'll know, be oh no there are lots no there are only four so if you take no risk you get the risk free rate hence the name, right? So you, you get the cash return for taking no risk. First risk you can take is being a loaner. You can take credit risk. I can lend money to somebody hoping to get it back. And if they don't give it back to me, I can sue them because it's a contractual claim. Now, because you have that contractual claim, the return above risk-free is not very high. So bonds on average make about 2% above risk-free which is a perfectly fine return if interest rates are four, not a very good return if interest rates are zero. Hmm. So second uh, way to make money is to take equity risk. Well, equity is a contingent claim, meaning you only get paid back if the bondholders all get their money back. So you think about lots of companies today, they have lots of debt, they can't even service their debt, let alone pay the debt back, which means their equity is worthless. Mm. Right? Cash flow doesn't support the equity value, yet people speculate that maybe that maybe it'll be worth more to somebody. Best Buy is a great, I mean, a Bed Bath & Beyond is oh, a great yes. example. Yeah. Right? The new meme stock. This company is going bankrupt, which means their business is broken, right? They can't generate cash flow. And yet the stock goes up 100% or 200% over a couple of days or weeks because punters, speculators, are hoping that they can cash out of a lottery ticket by giving it to somebody else. Wow. And, and what's what's crazy about that is ultimately that that stock certificate is a claim on the cash flow of the business. Mm. If the business doesn't have any good cash flow, then you have no claim. Um ultimately it, it, it it's you know, gambling of all sorts is kind of a funny thing, right? If you go to Las Vegas, for example, or Macau over closer to you. The longer you do it, the more you lose, right? That's the way the odds of the games work there. They favor the house. Now it's possible to go in, make a bet, get lucky and make some money. Yep. If you leave, if you stay and keep gambling, eventually that money will go back to the house because the odds are tilted against you. Same thing with a lottery ticket, the expected outcome is that that money goes to the house and the one person that wins is a small fraction of the total money paid in. So wait, that's a tax, right? Yeah. And you think about buys lottery tickets, it's a disproportionate tax on, on the poor relative to the wealthy because they have a hope that they're gonna be that one person that wins. So back to the four ways to make money. So first, mm -hmm. credit risk, second, equity risk. The third is illiquidity risk. Right. If I buy a stock, I, I can sell you those shares of stock tomorrow across an exchange and I can get liquid. Mm -hmm. If I own shares of a private business, I have to convince you in a private transaction to buy those shares. And so they're less liquid or even illiquid if you own a lot of private shares. Well, guess what? You actually get paid extra for that. So you get 2% above risk free for bonds. You yep. get 7% above risk-free for equities, long-term 10.5%. You get another 5% for illiquidity. So the long-term return closer to 15%. And then the last way is just leverage. 
And leverage is a tool. It can never make a bad investment good. Problem is it can and often does make a good investment bad because you're forced to sell at a bad time. But it can also enhance the return of an asset. Think about most people's homes. If you put 100% down and you bought your home for cash, if the price went up 10%, you make 10%. Okay. If you borrowed half the money and the price goes up 10%, you make 20%, 10 divided by 50. If you borrow 80% and the price goes up 10%, you make 50%. So yeah. there's an amplification of return. Now it works the other way, right? <laughs> Let's say you did, you know, you borrowed 90% of the value of your home and the price fell 10%. You didn't lose 10%. You lost 100% of your equity. Yeah. So leverage is a tool. It is mostly a good tool used properly, but those who use it on speculative high volatility assets, my favorite today is crypto. Crypto is yeah. an 80, 80 volatility asset. Right? Yep. Amazon stock and Bitcoin have the same volatility. And people who buy Amazon on leverage or Bitcoin on leverage are crazy. They're gamblers. They're speculators. And eventually that that turns out very badly. In fact, one of the things that most people don't know, you know, Amazon been public for 26 years, Carrie. Every year, including this year, every year, it's at a double digit drawdown. The average, and this is crazy, the average is 31%. So every year on average, holding Amazon, you lost 31% of your money. Well, when was the right time to sell? Well, that would be never. But who actually bought it 26 years ago at the IPO and held it to today? I say there's five people in the world. Jeff, his mom, his dad, his ex-wife, and Bill Miller. Same Is that right? Only five? Yeah. And, and, and there's probably six or seven, but really not very many. And, and the reality is because the volatility is so high, people can't handle it, so they sell. Yeah. And one of the things that I learned... You know, you had a question that will come to that, you know, kind of what do you learn over the course of your career? One of the things that I really learned is markets are created by humans, right? Markets are made up of human beings and human beings do two things really, really well. Like we're spectacular at these two things. We buy what we wish we would have bought, <laughs> right? Yep. So we buy things after they've gone up yep. and we sell what we're about to need. So when things go on sale, right? Investing is the only business where when things go on sale, people run out of the store and the cheaper the price, the further they run. I mean, think about any, you put wedding dresses on sale, people will beat each other up to buy the wedding dresses, but you put stocks on sale, people run out of the store. They run out the door. Yeah. And so is that something, you, I guess, um, mindset, but also understanding that uh, the way people behave, human behavior in investing, it, it, it's almost like do the opposite of what, of what everybody else is doing. Oh my gosh, so so true. So so you know, one of the things that's happening now is is there's a lot of options activity. So people okay. are gambling in the markets using options, and I use the term gambling intentionally because here's the problem: eighty five percent of options expire worthless. Yeah. Right. So I always say to people, if you ever have an urge to buy an option, sell an option. If you ever have an urge to sell an option, buy an option. Just do the exact opposite because you'll win because it's an 85% chance of being wrong. Look, if we flip a coin, we're 50 50. Yep. So the same thing is true with investing. If over the last 20 years, this JP Morgan data, over the last 20 years, if you just bought and held stocks, you made 8%. If you bought and held bonds, you made five and a half percent. So you could pick either one and, and do okay. If you bought a mix, you made about seven and a half percent. The average person made 2.9. 2.9. Like all they had to do is pick one or the other and sit with and it. Sit. Or, you know, rebalance. But it's it's the old adage, you know, don't just do something, sit there. People don't like to sit there. They want activity. They want to be active. And, and the, that human emotion is to buy what feels good, to go with the crowd. The, you know, it's it's up and therefore it must be good. And the problem is things mean revert, right? When things get overvalued, they tend back toward, yep. you know, fair value. And when things get undervalued, they, they trend back to fair value. Not immediately. 
So your your point is well taken in that what people should do <laughs> is the opposite of the masses. So when everybody's buying something, they should be selling it. And when everybody's selling, you should buy it. And look, that's you know, the Buffett quote and all the others, you know, be greedy <laughs> when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And it's easy to say hard to do. You know, my other big takeaway in and and I'm I'm old, I'm old. I got white hair. I've been around a long time. And, steady. And that, we both remember the Brady Bunch, so be careful. Yeah, no, 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 exactly. And look, I but I I'm 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 fine with that. Um, because the thing about investing, older is better because mm -hmm. you get wisdom. And you know, my my hero in the business, Roy Newberger, founder of Newberger and Berman here in the States, he went in the office every day to his 94. He managed his own money to his 101 and finally passed 107. Like, that's awesome. Good. And think about the people we think of as legends, the Julian Robertsons, you know, God rest his soul, passed away last year, or George Soros, or Michael Steinhardt, or Lord Templeton, septuagenarians, octogenarians, nonagenarians. There's something to the adage, well, one, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger, mm -hmm. right? So- you know, if, if you make a bad decision and you're young, you get wiped out, no one hears about you again. So we don't have to think about that. If you make small mistakes and live, you get experience and then you accumulate that wisdom and you get better at this game as you go on. So I, I do think it is a cumulative thing. So, I, so I, I, like, I like being, you know, on the old side in investing. I think the other piece of it is uh, discipline, right? Mm -hmm. The ability to stay disciplined and and this goes back to my first boss in investing. Well, my my I guess my second boss, my first boss retired. And then my second boss, when I went to work for that equity management firm, the firm was called Disciplined Investment Advisors, DIA. And we had these famous brown, they were an ugly brown, but they had this, this saying, they're coffee mugs. And they had a saying said, invest without emotion. Uh. Easy to say, hard to do. And if you can do that, right, if you can stay true to your discipline, focus on a repeatable process and remove emotion, right, that that emotion that says, I want to do what everyone else is doing. I want to go with the comfort of the crowd. I want to be at the center of the herd. And it's it's lonely, right, to, to be out at the edge. It's it's lonely to say, geez, everybody's buying stocks at 40 times earnings. I think I'll sell them. Um, and they might go to 50 times earnings or 60 times earnings, but eventually they'll go back to 15 times earnings and you'll make a lot of money. Wow. Actually, that's a that's a good point that you bring up that um, one of the things that I'd like to, to find out from you, you talk about you've been in the market for a while, Mark. Uh, what lessons have you learned along the way? I mean, you, you, you talk about patience. I think yep. people don't have patience anymore because, and I put it down to all this social media stuff of, you know, yeah. Tesla, let's go, let's go, let's go, and, and various other um patience comments. is is definitely gone. I'll give you per example. So so we have a, a unique family. So we have two older kids, uh, both in their 30s. And then my wife and I had a caboose 20 years later, gift from from up above. Oh. People always say, Well, how'd that happen? I'm like, don't know. And I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know? I'm like, I don't know. We we had no kids for 20 years and then got a third one. And and it's awesome because one, we're just way better parents the second time. Not that we are bad parents. Hmm. We just didn't know anything. Now yeah. we actually know stuff. And and the second thing is it keeps me young. I got to keep up with my 12-year-old. Like, you know, I'll walk in and I'll say, dad, let's wrestle. I'm like, I mean, on the floor wrestle? <laughs> like that was easy at 35. That's harder at, at 55 coming up on now, coming up on 60. And, but the thing about it is we said, so we're going to family movie night the other night. And we put on Raiders of the Lost Ark, said, you should see this. It's a classic. 15 minutes in. He's like, how much longer? Like the idea of sitting to watch a 90-minute movie, no way. He had wow. just no time for it. Now, we did force him. I mean, not physically, but you know, we 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 survived it. And uh, but but attention spans are short, and it is the social media. Everything's choppy, everything's quick hit. And so the idea of of buying something and holding it for a long period of time, it's not exciting. Trading is where it's yeah. at and speculating and gambling. And, but ultimately one of the big lessons for me was there are four types of market participants. 
And I tend toward the first, which is investor, right? So an mm -hmm. investor is someone who buys things that are selling below their fair value. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple idea. Seth Klarman and, and others have, have written books about it. Pretty simple idea. Really hard to do, but but simple idea. Okay. I want to be an investor. I want to be a value guy, you know, or gal. I, I mean, I, that that's what I, I believe in. I believe in value. Second type of market participant is a trader. Now, traders don't care about fair value. They just want movement, right? They, they need things that are moving and they want to scalp, uh, you know, from long or short. It's super hard. It's like gambling in a sense, in the sense that the odds are stacked against you. It's super hard, but there are some people who are good at it. I'm not one of them, so I don't do it. But but even traders are okay. The problem is the gamblers. The gamblers are the people who come in and try to trade, but then add leverage to the equation. And that's either using options where there's an embedded leverage or actual leverage where they're borrowing on margin. And the problem with that is the margin of safety is just not, not there and they end up getting completely wrecked. And then the fourth type of market participant are speculators. And speculators kind of got a bad rap. I don't mean a true speculator, which is just the opposite side of a hedger. Yeah. Right. You have a miner in Australia, they're producing, you know, gold. They sell their gold in the marketplace, in the futures market. Mm -hmm. They're net seller. Someone has to be a net long buyer, a speculator. They're just offsetting sides of a transaction. For every buyer, there's a seller. That doesn't make the speculator evil. They're just fulfilling a role. They they don't really they're part of the market. Care, right? They they just they're just taking the other side of that that hedger. So if I think about those four types of market participants, I, I you know I'm, I'm not I don't control big amounts of capital, so I'm not going to be the opposite side of a hedger. I, I think gambling is, is a fool's errand. Trading on occasion, fine, but but I want to be an investor. So that, that's the first takeaway. Second takeaway is that that discipline and that process. So if you think about again, everything's fours today. So the four yeah, P's, that's what I was thinking. So. Right? The yeah. four P's. If you think about investing, there, there, there are four P's. There's there's the people who are involved, mm -hmm. there's the philosophy that you follow. There's the process, and then there's the performance or the price. Mm -hmm. And most people do it backwards, I think. They focus on the price or the performance, and they chase the hot dot. And you know, one of my big takeaways early on was, if you can just avoid that, right? If you can just never hire a manager who's had a good three-year period or chase a stock that's had a big run-up or even a single day, right? Don't buy big up days and don't sell big down days. Um, and don't be a momentum chaser. I, I think that adds value. But flip it on the other side and say, to me, people matter first, right? Are they good, honest people of integrity? Mm -hmm. Do they have a good philosophy that they, pro that they follow? And then do they follow a disciplined process? The price will take care of itself. I'd say price is like a symptom, right? If you're coughing, you're already sick. You should have avoided getting sick. So same thing. If the price is bad or if the performance is bad, the process is broken or the philosophy is broken or the people are bad people doing bad things. So I tend to focus more on, on people. I like to, you know, to me, two things I look for, um, competitiveness. Like I love people who not only love to win, but hate to lose. So <laughs> that's my um, son, Mark. That's my son. Loves to win, hates to lose. Hate to lose. And look, Roy, um, again, Roy Newberger had this, this thing. He said, there's only three rules to managing money. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't lose money. And rule number three, don't forget the first two rules. Well, how do you do that? Well, the thing about if you take care of the losses, the gains take care of themselves. So one mm -hmm. of the things that drives me crazy, and again, I learned this from experience, is people tend to want to prove they're right in the market. Oh, right? yeah. They'll take a position, it'll go against them, and they're like, no, no, I'm right, the market's wrong. Well, market's never wrong. You are. And so the first loss is the best loss. The fastest loss is the best loss because the mathematics of loss are horrible. Down 10, got to be up 11. Down 20, got to be up 25. Down 50, got to be up 100. 
Mm. And God forbid you were in Peloton saying, no, it's a good company. It's a good company. Fine. Mm. It might be a good company. I mean, look, to me, selling coat racks with an iPad bolted on, like, no, no, they sell exercise bikes, right? The first 10 days, it's an exercise bike. Then it becomes a coat rack and it has an iPad <laughs> you know, put on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay, fine, you may like that business, but the stock a year ago was a horrible stock. The valuation was terrible. It went down 95%. Did it really? It down, oh, oh, Mark, it's, it's up 100% this year. I'm like, yeah, now you're only down 90% from last year. Wow. So you got to be up 20 fold to get even when you're down 95%. And that's one of my other favorite math tricks, right? What's the difference between down 90 and down 95? You lost half your money, right? So when people push a bad position, I, I think that's dangerous. So uh, Julian Robertson, who was a mentor of mine for many years, a famous uh, North Carolina grad and, and Tiger Fund manager, and again, passed away last year. Uh, I had the you know the luxury and, and gift really of of working with him for, for many, many years. And I also worked with and backed a lot of the people that used to work for him at Tiger that started new hedge funds around the world. And today manage over 10% of all the long, short money in the world, which is pretty amazing. Wow. And I asked him, you know, what made Julian so special? And every single one said two things. Uh, actually, it's really four things. Four things. <laughs> so it was four things. So one, most competitive person they knew, right? He was just super competitive, loved to win, but hated to lose. Second, man of unrivaled integrity. True story. One time he went through customs wearing a pair of shoes that he forgot to claim. Most people lie when they go through customs. They don't yeah. even declare everything, right? He actually wrote him a check saying, I forgot to declare my shoes. Here's a check. So man of unequaled uh, integrity. But, but the two things that people always said about him, where one, he always said, live to fight another day, right? You're not right. The market's right. Just take the loss, make it small, live, live to fight another day. But more importantly, and this is the hard thing that's so hard, and it kind of goes against some of the stuff I was saying earlier, but it, but it is a superpower in investing. They said he had an uncanny ability to double up. He would never double down. Not ever. Never double down because you're wrong. But when things were going well, he would press the accelerator. And that is a superpower because I'm saying, well, no, you should rebalance. You should have discipline. I do agree with that. But on occasion, when you got something really right, and let's say you bought it, it was really undervalued. Now it's just you know, marginally undervalued. You can buy more. Now, if it gets super overvalued, yeah, you should probably rebalance. Yeah. But that ability to, to double up onto things that are working, particularly things where you you take an investor approach, where you you understand what the real value of it is and you can buy in below value and it starts to, to rise. That's the thing you want to press. I want to know now, Mark, in, in today's environment of relatively high inflation, yeah. potentially going high, higher, uh, and interest rates on the increase, what is Mark Yusko looking at in terms of, you know, we talked about asset allocation earlier. Yep. Uh, uh, do you like commodities? I mean, Ray Dalio has recently come out with his asset allocation, which was fascinating. Yep. Um, I want to know, what are you looking at at the moment in this ever-changing world? So a couple of things. So, you know, I start from first principles like like Ray would, and 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 you look at it, you say, okay, if I, if I think about the big four assets, let's talk about bonds. Now, bonds are interesting because they had a terrible year last year, worst year ever in 140 years. Everybody hates them. And everybody's convinced that, you know, interest rates are going to stay high for, for longer. I kind of take the other side. I think we're in a deflationary bust, meaning around the world, in the Western world, every mm -hmm. day thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people turn 65. And it turns out 65 to 85 year old people, perfectly nice people, but they don't spend as much and they're not as productive. Yeah. And yeah. again, it doesn't mean they're bad people, just, just the reality. And so an aging demographic leads to deflation, not inflation. 
Inflation is caused by young populations. When you have a lot of 25 to 45 year old people, you get a lot of inflation because again, young people aren't very productive. They don't really know their jobs yet. They don't know how to run companies. It's that 45 to 65 sweet spot where you get high productivity, disinflation, nirvana for investing. So, so I really think that, that bonds are probably a pretty good thing. Not corporate bonds, not highly levered companies, but good old fashioned government bonds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I kind of like that. And particularly long duration bonds as a deflation hedge. Because I think by the end of this year, inflation will be a, a memory. We'll be back to deflation, falling prices. Uh, and, and I think that that will accelerate. So then we go to equities. Well, Equities, you can divide into multiple parts. You can look at developed market equities. Uh, within developed markets, you can look at you know Japan, Europe, and the US. Uh, of that trio, I think the US is the most overvalued. Um, I'd be underweight US. I'd be neutral weight uh, Europe. I think there are some interesting plays in, in value, a lot of overlooked companies in Europe. Um, and then Japan, I think, is pretty cheap. I think there's a lot of good companies, particularly in tech, in Japan that are that are pretty cheap. Then you jump over into emerging markets. Now, emerging markets, uh, I think is interesting, right? Everybody thinks the dollar is going to continue its super strong. Well, it actually hasn't been strong since October of last year, right? From January of last year to October, it went up almost 20%, but now it's crashed 10%. And emerging markets are the place. So look, demographically, emerging markets are amazing, right? They have lots of people in that 45 to 65-year-old sweet spot over the next 20 years. Um, just more people, more for physical people. India is a great example. They just made the largest commercial jet order in history uh, for 470 planes, I think. I mean, just amazing. So, so I really do like I like the BRICS, uh, you know, although China, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Russia really doesn't fit. It's really not, mm, not at the market. moment. Well, it's a developed market and it's still, people hate it and they want to hate on it. So they keep it in emerging markets, but it's really, not, it's it's not an emerging market the same way Korea is not an emerging market. Korea is still in the emerging market index, but the only reason is because the emerging market managers don't want to give back a third of their money. So they try to keep it in the index so they can call it emerging. But Korea is not emerging. I mean, high yeah. quality of living and and very developed. Um, so I like emerging markets. Uh, then to your question on commodities, commodities that third asset class in in the kids game. You know, rock paper scissors. Yeah. Uh, paper beats rock. In real life, rock beats paper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, rock paper. I mean, a uh, uh, physical hard assets are the most undervalued relative to paper assets they've ever been. Um, and so I, I like them a wait, lot wait, now. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Mark. With hard assets, what are you covering in that? So that's, you know, uh, base metals, precious metals, oil, um, you know, anything that we use to make stuff. So it could be okay. copper, it could be molybdenum, it could be, um, you know, gold, silver, uh, palladium, anything that we use to to make things. You know, oil. I'm a I'm a wild bull on on fossil fuels. You know, this idea that everyone's going to drive electric car, even even if everyone wanted an electric car, we don't have the it's infrastructure. Not true, you, you you couldn't get them for at least thirty years, right? And it's going to take. And and uh, I have some funny stories. But I just got an EV. I wanted a hybrid, right? I I I love Kia. I've had a Kia Nero. I want us, I want another Kia Nero, but it couldn't get one. Chip shortage problems. And the guy said, Oh, drive, drive the EV. I will say, I by the time I got out of the parking lot, I was like, I'm buying this car. It's wow. an amazing drive. But here's the problem. They didn't tell me all the stuff about, well, it takes an hour to recharge, even in a fast charger. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have an hour to sit around and wait. Yeah. And yesterday I dropped my son at drum practice and I went over to, you know, to recharge. There was someone at the recharger. You had to wait. So now I can't recharge. So that's that stinks. And they're like, well, just put one in your house. Yeah, I'm trying. It's a two-week backlog. And, and great. And eventually I have a home charger and I'll be fine. But here's the problem. I live in a you know pretty electrified place. Imagine trying to have all EVs in a third-tier city in India. No chance, right? We're going to string the wires from, I mean, just it's just not going to happen. So 
It's just not. So I I I do think that that commodities are interesting. The the challenge I have, let's say gold, right? I know some of your your viewers like gold, and and you you right. guys are, yeah. And um, I love gold, right? But but here's the problem: gold has been manipulated for a very long time, and I say that unabashedly because look, J.P. Morgan admitted to it last year. Right? I'm, I'm not saying you got a school, right? They agreed. I was this. They paid a nine hundred sixty million dollar fine without admitting guilt. How does that work? Isn't the fine an admission of guilt if you pay mm-hmm. almost a billion dollars? I'm like, well, yeah, but here's the thing: we made twenty billion spoofing gold prices in London, but we paid a billion. That's five percent. That's like a cost of doing business. So gold should be much, much higher. Look, we doubled the amount of U.S. dollars in existence in the last three years. Mm-hmm. 247 years of dollars, three years, half the dollars in existence. Mm-hmm. I mean, just let that sink in. And you're like, gold should be up at least twice what it is. But it's not because of this systematic. So I, I think markets like that, where there's such a big futures market that speculators can naked short and create, this happened in the oil market, uh, you know, with with frequency, you know, you can get everyone on one side in the paper market. And in the again, in the good old days, which I and you can remember, if I wanted to sell you a barrel of oil, right, or a bar of gold, I actually had to have a that physical barrel gold. of oil or a bar yeah. of gold. Now I don't have to. I just write a contract and I sell it to you. And as long as we settle up the contract before I have to go find the, the old the oil or the gold, all is good. Well, what that does is it creates an imbalance of paper goods versus physical goods. And when there's an imbalance of paper goods, you can get downward pressure on prices, which is what happened in gold, what happened in the oil markets last uh, right after 2020 when Saudi uh, depressed the price. Remember what negative prices? Oh, that was insane. Yep. Crazy, right? And I think it's happening in Bitcoin pricing today too, because they have futures in Bitcoin, but not a spot ETF, which I think is intentional. So- that's a long way of saying, look, I like gold and I love the gold miners. The gold miners are so cheap. So undervalued. Well, actually, but, but the problem yeah. is, Carrie, there's no natural buyers. All the retail money is like given up, right? They, they've lost enough money. They're just tired. It's such a small market that the big institutions like the sovereign wealth can't really buy it. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like MLPs. MLPs and gold miners have the same problem. Great What's asset. MLP? A, a master limited partnership, so oil okay. and gas pipelines, and you know these oil and gas pipelines in the U.S. yield eight nine percent. You got huge cash flow growth, but there's no natural buyer because people lost a bunch of money in 2020 because oil prices collapsed, and so they they ran away. And when markets lack natural buyers, whether it's the high yield market or you know small cap stocks, micro cap stocks. Um, when the big institutions get so big that they can't play in a particular market, it's hard for those markets to to find fair value. And I think that's what's happening in gold miners today. So I do like those. So I I, I own a little bit of there. And then and then the last part of it is digital assets. So I'm I'm a huge believer in digital assets. I spend a lot of my time uh, in in the crypto space. I love Bitcoin. To me, Bitcoin is digital gold. Right? It's it's has all the benefits of gold. It's a yep. scarce asset. That is a perfect store of value that is money, right? There's only one money in the world. That's gold. What is money? Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. That's gold or Bitcoin. Yeah. Everything else is debt. Credit, yeah. It's a currency. It's credit. And that doesn't mean it's bad. But let's remember, at the core of all money is gold. In vaults, in central banks, then they build debt on top of it, and we trade it as currency, and that's perfectly fine. I live in the fiat world. I spend dollars. You spend Aussie dollars. I mean, that's all fine, but that's credit. At the bottom of it is gold. And ultimately, I think Bitcoin has a digital version. And the reason I like Bitcoin is digital gold, again, back to movies. So I, I like this movie called Knight's Tale. And it's about jousting and this, this knight. And he wins this tournament and he gets this gold calf. And he literally bangs it on a table, breaks it in half and says, go sell this, do what you do. I'm like, that's a really bad way to divide. It's not very precise. It's kind of hard. And if I had a brick of gold here, a bar of gold, and I want to send you half of it, 
one, I'm not strong enough to break it in half, so I couldn't do it. And even if I could, I can't stuff it in my computer and send it to you. So it's not very divisible and it's not very portable, mm -hmm. not very transferable. Bitcoin, with a couple punches of my keystroke on, on my phone, I can send you Bitcoin. So it has all the benefits of a scarce asset like gold and the benefits of technology using blockchains to have this, this permanent immutable ledger. So, so I, I do like the transition over a long period of time from gold to, to digital assets. Uh, it's interesting you talk about that because a lot of people out there are poo-pooing Bitcoin at the moment saying it's a Ponzi scheme, not worth yeah. anything. And eventually governments will uh, potentially turn around and outlaw it, say can't use Bitcoin at all. What do you say to that? Yeah, look, the thing about it is it's kind of funny, right? You can outlaw things you control, right? So, you know, a government can outlaw things in their borders, right? In their nation states, in their rule of law. You know, uh, you, you saw it, right? In the lockdown, right? People in Australia were restricted from their normal freedoms, right? You can't go out of your house yes. after a curfew. You can't, you know, go to the store, whatever. Governments can can get away with that. Um, but then the Auss Aussie government couldn't make rules in the U.S. because the borders right. don't work, right? And the U.S. couldn't make rules in, in Australia. So if there's a decentralized world, Okay, where and let's use uh, crypto as an example. Bit, let's use Bitcoin as an example. Crypto is different, but Bitcoin is different. Bitcoin is truly decentralized, meaning there is no CEO, there is no home office, right. there is no corporation. Right, it is an asset that exists. This is pretty amazing on thousands of computer nodes all around the world. So when China tried to ban it, now they didn't really ban Bitcoin; they banned the mining. Uh, mining and exchanges. So what happened to those exchanges? Well, they all just picked up and moved to Japan and Korea. What happened to the miners? They picked up and moved to West Texas. So that, that activity is still going on. The network is still secure. The network's still going on. The price continues to rise. Now it has volatility, but the price, you know, from 14 years ago at zero yep. to today at 23,000, it's gone up, right? And the yeah. value has gone from zero to you know, half a trillion. So what's interesting about it is a decentralized network can't be banned, can't be controlled. Now people say, well, you could, you could control the on-ramps and off-ramps. Yeah. You could say, which I think is actually coming in the U S that you can't use a bank to convert exactly dollars into Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, okay. But guess what I can do? I can go on a VPN and go to Canada and do it that way. Well, then Canada will ban it. Okay, then I'll go to Germany. Well, then Germany will ban it. Well, then I'll go to, and some country that you know wants to tax it will say, well, we're not going to ban it. So everybody will come here. And so ultimately, uh, remember when when the horseless carriage, you probably wouldn't remember, but in the United States, the horseless carriage came at the turn of the century. And the uh, the horse and buggy lobby went to the city of New York and said, we want you to stop this. So we want you to pass a law called the red flag law. We've all heard the term red flagging. So this was the law that said, if you bought a horseless carriage, you had to hire a human to walk in front of the car with a red flag. <laughs> now, Is has anyone wrong? ever seen a person walking in front of a car with a red flag? No. Because it was a dumb idea, but it actually, it was a law. It did get passed. There wow. were people that did it. And, and then it went away because it was stupid. So ultimately, good technology, disruptive technology always wins. Um, the internet, right? We're using the internet right now. We're, we, this is amazing, right? We're having a real-time conversation in HD, in like words coming out of my mouth, into a metal and glass box, through the airwaves, under a trans amazing. cable into your metal glass box, into your ear, instantaneously, no lag, no nothing. How does that work? I don't really care. But here's the thing. The phone companies didn't like it. In the 1990s, the phone companies said, we like our transatlantic copper wires, and we want to charge you $3 a minute to talk to Carrie. So we're not going to let the internet happen. And there was a bill, okay? And, and Al Gore, right, our famous vice president, uh, 
you know, didn't invent the internet, but he did save it. He blocked that bill oh. from ever getting to a vote. And and his logic was, that's ridiculous. Why would we not want to make something free using technology so that people would have more money in their pocket to spend on other things? That that seems like a good use of technology. And it was. Now, it was bad for the phone companies, but the phone companies still exist. And we all still pay them to use this. Yes. And we pay them for our internet service. And, and they've morphed and they've changed. Imagine, yeah, because now we pay our telephone companies to have internet. So they embraced it. And I think the same thing will happen here is the banks don't want digital assets because they think it disrupts them. Well, it does. You know, a simple example. So for centuries, we humans got our views once a week from the church. We would go to church and they would tell us what to think, how to think, who to believe, because we couldn't read, we couldn't write, there, there were no books, there, you know, and we were that was we were at their their whim, right? And the printing press busted that monopoly. Because now you could write down stuff, you could pass it on, you could teach people to read. And then what happened? That monopoly shifted to government, either state-owned media or state-controlled media. And for centuries, the media controlled. So that they told us what to think. We'd watch the news, they'd tell us how to interpret things, they'd give us our ideas. Well, the internet came along and busted that monopoly and information became bi-directional. I use the example, if I want to know what's happening in the election in Australia, in the old days, I have to wait for someone from New York to fly to Australia, write a story, send it back, have it edited, show up in the New York Times two days later. Now I go to Twitter and I watch a periscope of people standing in line chanting some candidate's name. I'm like, that's who's going to win. And so information became bi-directional. So what happened? All of media and all of commerce, all that wealth went into new media companies. ABC, NBC, CBS, now it's Netflix. Yeah. And mom and pop stores, now is Amazon. Well, blockchain does the same thing to financial services. For 800 years, the banks have had a stranglehold on trust, right? If I want to send you money, uh, or yeah, if I wanted to, if I wanted to lend you money, eight hundred years ago, I would lend you money, and I would write down in my ledger, Carry owes me a hundred dollars. You would come away, come back in a year, pay me one hundred and ten. I'm like, oh, Carrie, you owe me two hundred and twenty. Like, no, no, I only borrowed a hundred. Well, I'm an unscrupulous guy. I wrote two hundred, and you couldn't trust me because I wasn't trustworthy. So, the Medici's came along eight hundred years ago and said, no, 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 Carrie, you keep a ledger. Mark, you keep a ledger, and we, the benevolent Medici's, for yeah, a small the benevolent, fee, yep, benevolent for a small fee, will decide that you both wrote down a hundred, unless Mark bribes us, and then when he writes down two hundred, we say, "Carrie, Mark's ledger is the right ledger, so you owe him two hundred bucks." So that system has been kind of corrupt for a long time. Well, now we have a third ledger, a digital public immutable, permanent, transparent ledger that says, Mark and Carrie entered in a transaction, $100. There it is. We don't have to trust anybody. We have truth. We're replacing trust with truth. And that's what digital assets and cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is all about. And that's why it's as inevitable as that transition from you know, no internet to internet, from no mobile net to mobile net. I remember when, when Google bought uh, I mean, I have an Apple phone, but 80% of the people in the world have an Android phone. Google bought Android in 2005. And people what? said, what do you know about operating systems? That's so stupid. No, not stupid. Now they have 80% market share around the world yeah. because operating systems matter. And all blockchain is, is an operating system for value instead of media and communication. So do you look at Bitcoin as an investment or do you look at Bitcoin as a truth ledger? Ah, both. Yes. Oh, great question. Just like gold is both a currency and a commodity, right? Gold is a commodity. Yep. I can use it to make a chalice. I can use it to make earrings. I can use it for any number of industrial uses. It's also money, right? And if you think of the $10 trillion of gold above ground, half of it is the commodity, 
use. Half of it is the monetary use, sitting in bars, backing up central banks. And I think Bitcoin is the same thing. It'll have its commodity use, its you know use for payment rails and, and ledger, uh, a truth ledger, but it'll also have this monetary element as a scarce digital asset. So it, it, it will come back in favor. All those people out there will suddenly turn around and go, oh, actually, it's what you said. The red flag is gone. Yeah, it's it'll take time. Thing. You know, it's yeah. funny. Um, I use this example. People get mad at me, but I don't, I, I don't know why, but people get mad. So I used to show a picture of 10-year-old LeBron James, mm -hmm. right? And I asked, how much would you pay for this kid's future earnings? People say, oh, that's, that's slavery. I'm like, no, it's not slavery. I'm saying how much, if you could write a contract, how much would you pay that 10-year-old kid to have their future earnings? David Bowie did it with his future royalties. It's just, it's just a transaction. How much would you pay? And most people look at the picture and like, not very much. You just look like an average 10-year-old kid. Well, that 10-year-old kid is LeBron James. And he didn't look very special at 10 years old. By 16, he was pretty special. And today, maybe arguably the best basketball player that's ever lived. Although I like Michael Jordan, but people <laughs> like LeBron. So it has to do with the capability to potential ratio. How capable is the average 14-year-old? Not very capable. Not very What's capable. their potential? Really big, right? That's the way it works. And so the same thing, Bitcoin is 14 years old. It's a teenager. <laughs> it's not supposed to be done yet. And when it's 140 years old, it'll probably be pretty capable. Wow, that's a that's a great analogy. Mark, we're running out of time, which is driving me nuts because I really, really want to talk. I've only got through half of the stuff I want to talk I to you know, about. I know. I, I don't do short well, Carrie, so we'll, uh, we'll come back and we'll do it again. I'd but, love uh, to have you back on again because there's just a wealth of knowledge. There's a couple of things I, I, I want to ask you is, first of all, a lot of our um, audience is based in Australia. Um, if they're interested in what you do at Morgan Creek Capital Management, yep. how do they get in touch with you? So uh, we, our website is morgancreekcap.com, and there's information there on, on the firm. And then I'm on Twitter all the time. My wife says way too much, but yep. at Mark Yusko, just M-A-R-K-Y-U-S-K-O. Yep. And, you know, so funny. I use Twitter. It, it's like a, a, a micro blog. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, I put my stuff out there and, and it's just how, it's how I think. And, you know, there's this, this thing that, that a famous author, I can't remember who it was said that if I can't read what I wrote, how do I know what I think? So one of the really important things to do in life is to write stuff down so that you can mm -hmm. go back and look at it and, and see what you thought and figure out if it was good, bad, or indifferent. So, so Twitter works. And then, and then I've done a lot of podcasts and stuff. If you Google me, stuff will show up and, and there's, there's information out there. I do a weekly one uh, on something called on the margin uh, where we kind of do a weekly update on, on macro. Um, but uh, that's, that's me. That's us. Okay. Well, Mark, let's wrap this up and let me ask you this for all those people out there that are listening. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is not financial advice. This is just educational and a bit of fun that we're having today, but I'd like to ask you, Mark, three things that you think people should be looking at right now in this yep. world of potentially high inflation, but you said coming into deflation yeah, look, is really interesting. I, I, think, I think deflation is more likely than inflation, uh, just based on demographics. You know, demographics is destiny. So I think people should study demographics and should look at the relationship between you know, working age population growth, right? GDP growth is equal to working age population growth plus productivity. And we know working age population growth out 30, 40 years with certainty, because we know how many babies are born. We know when they turn 25, yep. we know when they turn 45, we know when they turn 65. And so we know what that working age population growth looks like. And, and so understanding that, and I would say, if you want to know what happens in Europe, look at Japan nine years earlier. If you want to know what happens in America, look at Japan 11 years earlier. And that's because Japan's 11 years ahead of the United States demographically in terms of, of how many mm -hmm. people you know, turn that, that 65 to 85 year old range. So that's, so that's one thing to be looking at is, is the demographics of countries. And people say, oh, but we can fix that with immigration. Eh, not really. 
No, you know, my, net immigration is a good thing. Look, I'm I'm a huge look to me. Borders should be open. And you should let people come and go. Most of us are immigrants, right? I mean, yeah. I wasn't born. You know, my my ancestors weren't born here. They emigrated, and I'm I'm all for open borders. And people say, oh, but it doesn't work. And there's too many. It does actually it rebalances. Well, it, it rebounds it. And there are a couple of things that are interesting, right? It's it's like the, the uproar about AI. AI is going to eliminate all the jobs. Okay. They said that about the internet. They said that about the steam engine. They said that about, you know, irrigation. Every time there's a technological innovation, people say the jobs are going to go away. Yes, certain jobs do go away. Like when, when Donald Trump came to North Carolina when he was campaigning, he went to this woman at a rally and he said, I'm going to get your job back. Like, no, no, you're not. No, her job, textile worker, it's staying in China. It's never coming back. That doesn't mean you can't get her another job. We can retrain her or give her some education or find another company to come to North Carolina. But that that job, that job's oh. gone. But here's the thing. We have more jobs in the world today than any time in human history. Full stop, right? And that's that's the nature of human ingenuity. We are positive, energetic creatures. In fact, one funny thing. I always say, who was the third person that went out to kill a mastodon with a spear? Because the first two didn't come back. So who was the third one that said, yeah, I'm going to be able to do this and figured out if you hit them right here, you can get the mastodon. But we are an optimistic species. And, and because of that, human ingenuity thrives and, and we develop these new things. And yes, they are disruptive. And, and yes, there's breakage. But at the end, we're very resilient and good things come out of it. So that's one thing I'd look at. Second thing I'd look at is um, I, I do worry about this, this big overarching, uh, I'll call it a, a, a overreaction uh, the whole climate emergency thing, <laughs> there is none, right? Full stop. There, there, there's no climate emergency. There never has been. When I was growing up, the cover story where we were growing up, the cover story was the ice age, right? Absolutely. We were 10 years away from an ice age. Now we're 10 years. And by the way, in the last three years, the earth is cool. Correct. No one talks about it, but the earth is cool. But here's the thing. Weather, climate is a thousand year trend. Right? There's lots of data on this. It's a thousand year trend. You cannot measure a thousand year trend on one year or even 10 years or even no. 20 years. Right? So it's silly. But making decisions based on that is even sillier. So I, I do think you have to watch that and, 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 and be cognizant of it. And that's why I think materials and commodities are so important yeah. because they, the stuff to create, like if everybody wants an EV, we got to find a whole bunch more lithium and, and cobalt or come up with gallium arsenide technology or some other technology to make better batteries, which that'll happen too. Um, but we don't have enough stuff to make all the things that we need for the climate emergency. So that's one. Yeah. All right, that's the second one. And the, and the third is, is this, uh, this evolution of technology, right? I believe that the digital age is simply the evolution of computing. And in the 1700s and 1800s, everything was about converting human power, muscle power into uh, machine power. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things, and it's not very politically correct, but it's fact, slavery pretty much ended globally with the discovery of oil, right? It wasn't legislated away, right. and, and you know, but because what happened is oil, a barrel of oil has 40 person years of energy. One barrel of oil is 40 human years. So you don't need as many slaves. You don't need as many people to build pyramids if you got machines. Post the machine age, now we're moving to the cognitive age. And we started in 1954 with the invention of the mainframe computer, then 68 with the microchip, then 82 with the personal computer. It's always 14 years because young people invent everything new because they don't know what they don't know. 82 with the personal computer, 96 with the internet, 2010 with the mobile net, and 2024 with the truth net, which is this substituting, you know, trust with truth, which is what blockchains do. So all of the erosion of nation states and what does a nation state really mean in a world where a decentralized network can allow anyone anywhere to exchange value? Mm. Interesting thing. So I would, I would spend time looking at that too. Mark, 
It's been fascinating having a chat with you over there in North Carolina. As you said, um, it's interesting. Here we are. Technology is changing the way we communicate. And one thing out of COVID, it's uh, it's managed to get us all communicating in different ways. Absolutely. And I want to remind everybody out there, you can contact Mark, uh, at Morgan. What is it? Morgan Creek Cap. Morgan Creek Cap. Com. And on Twitter, yep. Mark Yusko, Y-U-S-K-O. And the most, lots of important things, lots of fours in the conversation today, ladies and gentlemen, lots of fours, even a 14 or two thrown in there. But what Mark said, I think is really important. It's the people, the four Ps were people, philosophy, process, and performance. But he said performance is not the key thing. People are the key thing. Mark Yusko from Morgan Capital. It's great to see you. Let's get you back on again soon. And then we can finish this conversation. All right. Thanks, Carrie. Be well, and we'll talk soon.